Hi, thank you so much for such a um, generous introduction. And I want to pause, I mean, you just mentioned so much about care, and it's actually because of care that I'm actually not here um, or there with you. Um, and this is about my daughter and these choices we have to make when suddenly family members require more proximity that we had planned. Um, and basic and, and also just to talk about care, I really want to thank all the wonderful people from Sonic Acts um, that um, I've been sort of emailing with all the time and that I have the um, pleasure not to meet. So I really want to thank Mirna for inviting me, Victoria, Michaela, Zarina, Sebastian, and Paul, because um, it feels really a space of great care that has been created, at least for us. Um, as speakers. Um, yeah, I I don't see you. I want to say this too, actually. It's uh, it's one of those Zoom things that we are now getting more and more used to. Um, but still, I don't actually see your faces. I just see the stage. So it's very hard for me to really understand when I'm being too long or very boring. Um, I do see gestures, though. So in case <laughs> there's something happening, <laughs> please perform. Um, I was thinking to go through um, particularly two, two, two projects, exhibitions, uh, multidisciplinary um, events that I've been um, engaged with and curating in the, in the last few years. They actually are a little old. They're mostly happening. They all mostly happened in 2019 and 20, but they were very, very much centered on toxicity. And I thought also maybe to start with um, a little story that um, has to do with me personally. And I think it's one of those stories that probably many of us actually have um, some more, of course, some less. As we know, toxicity is um, not evenly distributed. Um, and it starts uh, where I was born which is a place in the south of Italy, in a region called Calabria, which is the very, very last region of what looks like a boot facing Sicily. And I think that when we think of the south of Italy, um, or many people think about the south of Italy, we think about these blue coasts and beautiful waters, um, sunny environment, very good food, and um, a welcoming atmosphere, which I think is generally being I'm thinking perhaps more um, taught abroad that actually lived inside. Um, I had a beautiful childhood, I must say, in these beautiful waters. And I think that's something that maybe is always at the core of the difficulty in feeling and sensing toxicity is its great invisibility in many cases. And also the fact that its deferred action comes much later than your first encounter. So very often you encounter it, but you don't know that it's actually happening. Um, so I was bathing as every other child uh, in the little village I grew up in, um, in these blue waters. Um, and I think that I had no idea about toxicity until actually a world event happened that I suddenly knew about, um, which was Chernobyl, which I'm sure many of you um, have heard about at the time already, which was 1986. So I grew up in Italy in the 80s, and actually Italy at the time decided also to host a number of children, particularly coming from Chernobyl to Italy in different, um, in different regions of Italy, which is actually how I also met people and was very much um, yeah, engaged with TV. And you know, it made it all the media, especially at least in Italy, which is my only experience. Um, and, and, and why I'm tracing this parallel is because something that felt so far away and that we had the potential to host even was actually in a very different way, but in the same level of radioactivity, also very close, yet absolutely concealed. Um, some maybe have heard about a story that is now mostly known as the boats of poison. Um, which is basically the story of 
the transport of toxic and radioactive materials um, throughout the Mediterranean, um, and particularly, I would say, fortified in the 80s when the first laws also around the definition of, um, or like the strengthening of laws around the definition of toxic waste um, are coming together up to 1989, where the Basel Convention actually really tries at least to put some borders towards where toxic and radioactive waste is actually brought to. And this is the moment in which this goes very largely in the hands of criminal organizations and very close cooperation with um, with the state, um, I would say, very often also with police and military departments and, of course, uh, companies and um entrepreneurs interested in being part of this deal. Um, and what happened, and this is how I knew about it, what you see in this image is a, is a boat, um, which was called the Jolly Rosso, and it's still known as the Jolly Rosso, which suddenly um, arrived as the kind of carcass on the coasts uh, where I grew up, uh, literally at like a few hundred meters away from the beautiful blue waters we were talking about. And something that I want to highlight here is that when this boat arrives, it's actually, I mean, the, the, the workers on the boat, which are only a few people, are saved. There's no death. And actually, at this point, the boat does not actually contain any toxic material, but actually tobacco and some other things. But as the investigation starts and the attention rises because of the spectacularity of the size of this boat and the modes of the event and the ways in which the which is in which the event of this arrival is actually photographed, creates an enormous um, attention that basically opens up um, investigations that finally open a kind of Pandora box of um, enormous, um, yeah, toxic and radioactive waste um, exchanges, not, not exchanges, I mean, they go from one country to the next, they come mostly from all of Europe, pass through the south of Italy, and are usually then dumped either on the south Italian coast or in much larger um, and much larger scale um, on the coast of Somalia, Mozambique, Nigeria, Kenya, Zaire, I mean, Lebanon. What is unveiled is via the collaboration with Ndrangheta, which is the specific topology of mafia you have in Calabria and, uh, and the Camorra, which is what you have more in Naples and, and the region of Campania, is that they are part of what they call uh, eco-mafia traffic, um, which is literally dumping waste in exchange or toxic and dangerous waste in exchange of, of course, liquidity, but also the traffic of weapons um, and of people sometimes as well. Um, what you see, the, the people you see in the images are actually different people that have been involved in these particular cases that have been going on since basically uh, the 90s. Um, Jolly Rosso arrives in the coasts in 1990 and have to this day not completely been closed. On the left, you see um, Ilaria Alpi and Miriam Rottavin. Um, she's, a, she's a reporter for TG3, which is uh, like a national Italian TV station. Um, at this point, she's actually in Somalia, where she went for some completely other type of reportage, but becomes through informants more and more aware of what is happening in the relationship between Italy and Somalia on toxic waste trade, and is actually murdered um, in Somalia in 1994, together with the photo reporter as well. Um, who you see in another photo is Natale de Grazia. He was one of the main um, investigators, actually, and almost witnesses also, because um, it became a huge investigation on the, let's say, Italian ports, and especially South Italian ports. Murdered as well, just a few years later. Um, and the, and the, yeah, the crazy thing about this is how much, let's say, police, um, of course, through essentially state officials, has been trying, and of course, mafia involvement has been trying to completely um, clear the traces and 30 years into the fact, the, the, the case is not completely closed yet. And this, why I'm telling this story is because this type of story is not uncommon. Um, it's actually very, very common, which is the um, uh, disastrous aspect of it. Here, what you see is, you know, the other side of the south of Italy, what is usually not seen, what is usually not, um, you know, uh, talked about, which is not usually distributed in uh, travel guides and different touristic images. 
Um, and you see the parallel with many other places that you would just not necessarily relate um, to what is the south of, of the Italian country. To this date, to be honest, since the 90s, so many more cases have been found again without, and this is one of the aspects that I think I want to talk about now also with um, exhibitions and other projects that I've been engaged with, which is really the issue of visibility, the difficulty in what making visible um, the, the complicity of so many different actors, which is the ways in which usually this is possible. Um, the incredible entanglement of the different actors. Um, the, the terms of the trade, which is very often based on enormous also economic disadvantage, right? It's short-term needs, very often also of survival of cash or economy in exchange and at the expense of uh, long-term trades or long-term visibility or possibility of vision. Um, and also, I think one of the very difficult aspects is the, the kind of um, tracing and making visible the relationship between cause and effect. Toxicity is very often, again, Chernobyl is like the spectacular case. And that's why I mean, that is what you know of, right? And, but the, what defines toxicity is that it's mostly a very unspectacular event. It's a slow death um, that is very hard to trace, and it's so slow that it's very hard to trace the direct relationship between cause and effect. Um, and this is why um, many years later, um, together with a number of researchers from the Rachel Carson Center, um, we founded what is now called Toxic Commons. On the one hand of what not wanting to look at toxicity as something special. On the other, to want to create a group uh, interested in, let's say, uh, putting forth investigations that try to address um, the issue or its aspects from different angles and also with very different ways of narrating. And I would say also in distributing that narration, right? Because I must say, for example, the, our beautiful collaborators from the Rachel Carson Center, you know, we're constantly uh, highlighting how it is so important to get things out of academia, right? Like how do actually, actually, how do stories travel? How can you make this travel, them travel in order to, not, not just in order to, mobilize. I don't think it's just about activism, but it's actually about trying to work, for example, directly with different communities that are affected in order to also think and work on a number of different viable solutions. Now, nobody involved in this project imagined, you know, to, to be to be able to um, work on any case entirely by themselves, right? So the idea is always to work with different people and groups. Um, but there is something about the necessity to um, engage with a multitude of disciplines and spaces in which these disciplines exist um, in order to confront it and work towards it. Because one of the biggest, I think, frustrations even would be we understand we see it and now what right how do you move on actually um so which is not something we totally moved on from as a fact um so i'll i'll, I'll go back to this later um so we started to uh work on a number of projects um including exhibitions um and one of the first I want to talk to you about is um, at Kunsthalle Extra City in, uh, in, the, in, in, in Belgium, in Antwerp, um, where I was curator at the time, together actually with uh, Eliana Fukianaki, uh, given the pause on her before. Um, and one of the things that we really wanted to pause on is what is actually happening here while you feel and you think everything is happening elsewhere, can you focus on what is happening here? And also, can you feel entangled, complicit, empathic, but also understanding their toxicity has no borders. There is no elsewhere, really. And it's a matter of time, perhaps, um, more than just um, a division, let's say. Um, and so we started working. This is this is the space um, that Kunsale had at the time. I don't know if it still does actually, but it was a for, former um, 
uh, how do you say, industrial um, clothes cleaning company. So essentially, the the land on which it was was um, and still is heavily contaminated. So we started by really, you know, looking into very basic questions like, okay, so the land is contaminated. What is the level of contamination? What is it contaminated with? What are the legal parameters for defining, you know, its use? Because it was very interesting. It could be rented as a public space as contaminated, but not but not sold. And the only interest of the owner was if he would find somebody to sell it to, then he would actually decontaminate it, um, which also made our existence there extremely precarious. Um, and we also started just looking at Belgium, you know, like also where are we, you know, where are the, the potential spaces of contamination, where is radioactivity, what is the situation of nuclear power plants, etc. like really trying to start examining the, the place from which we were speaking and working while at the same time inviting artists and I would say really artists, researchers, artists, activists, artists, practitioners um, to uh, be part of what became a collaborative um, and maybe choral um, storytelling of very tiny stories that felt very, very far and in very different contexts, continents, situations and conditions yet had a lot in common. And actually, in each story, you could see also the repetition of very specific patterns. Um, one artist um, who's also an architect, Adrian Tirto, literally created um, a bunker, as you can see. Um, he basically divided the space of the exhibition in two parts. Um, and the idea was really to work between what is visible and what is actually remains invisible. What is the facade and what is concealed behind this facade? Again, also to highlight something else that I wanna say about toxicity, which is that it's a, it's a byproduct. Toxicity is not never something you aim for, it's the byproduct of something else. And that something else, that desire for that something else, whether it's based on greed, on economic advantage, Etc. 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 An economy, unfortunately, has a huge role in this. Um, is the byproduct of something else that hence needs to be concealed behind very often very charming facades, as we will see also in some other artists' work that are very able to to sort of show um, such particular aspects. Um, something also that. Um, in, in this became very interesting is that some, some artists, and in this case, uh, her name is Francisca Piervos, who had worked very much on Eternit, who maybe you're familiar with. I think this is also one of the most maybe famous toxic materials there are, which is asbestos, and Eternit is maybe the most famous multinational that has engaged with it and continues to produce it and distribute it because again very often um, production continue they just morph and change it has a different name now and produces somewhere else but it still exists um, and what you see here is a vase it's a very very famous ethnic vase that you could actually find almost everywhere um, around um, around the building of the exhibition space and that became a very interesting just even just connection point in sort of having an element that felt so close and so familiar and so many people had no idea about the fact that it was predominantly made out of ethernet, which is not toxic until it actually uh, gets ruined or you know time does something to it so it, it's really about the it's powder it's about breeding uh, asbestos that becomes toxic so it's almost like if one would even have at least this basic knowledge there would be even ways of protecting from it but already sharing that basic knowledge would, would make them obviously the the selling and distribution impossible. So, so we had a number of elements in the show that were really kind of connecting traces or connecting points with also the local community living around us and, um, and visiting the show, uh, which was an interesting dispositive for making emerge different stories that were then shared at different times, um, which of course came out actually particularly during um, uh, guided tours um, and so on so in a very informal way and we had not even imagined that so much would actually come out um, these are also different elements of the show um, on the top for example you see we, we decided to literally open parts of the of the of the pavement to see actually what's um, what's underneath which also in this case was like full of asbestos and other materials 
Um, we engaged what you see in the in the orange parts, which was almost all the inside also of the exhibition spaces, was um, different stories, um, actually coming also from different sources, theory, academy, folk stories, um, poems, fiction, quotes from films, etc all speaking of toxicity and different experiences of toxicity. So that kind of tried to also um, engage with storytelling through the works of artists that were kind of contextualized also through even more stories. I think maybe we did too much. I think there's always a self-criticality that needs to happen in shows, but I would say that also the intensity and the number of, of, of these experiences was quite overwhelming in realizing how present and again everywhere it is um, even when not seen um, what you see in the middle is also a quite um, interesting story of um, I don't know how many of you know but um, there's a quite a very important story of toxicity in the history of painting. There's a lot of colors that throughout history and made us in different geographical regions actually had very toxic components at the base. And one of the most famous one is called lead white because it's made of lead, uh, which is super toxic. And of course, who mostly experiences the fumes of such a toxicity is actually the people preparing the, the, the color and being exposed to it um, in you know, large amounts, uh, basically, which is very often artist assistants or at the time slaves preparing, because this was really used from the Romans to the Chinese empire, Flemish painting, etc. cetera. Um, but what it was also used in was actually women's makeup. There is a whole period, which is mostly in six, seven, eight, in 1800s, um, in which, in particular uh, European regions, I would say mostly Central West Europe, you know, being pale, particularly pale, was, was, a, was a common trait of beauty. Um, and this is why this particular makeup um, was incredibly um, useful, not only because it colored the skin, but also because the effects that its toxicity produced was actually making women more and more pale. At the edge of, I mean, some women would die at the end. I mean, they would get these stops, their, their stomachs um, and digestive systems would stop functioning. And this is also why their paleness, whiter than white, um, um, was right before death, was this moment of extreme attraction in that particular um, fashion, um, which, I, which I thought was quite um, curious as a trait, which is this, um, let's say, flirtation between toxicity, desire, and death. Um, these are other um, artists' uh, contributions. What you see on the left is Don't Follow the Wind, which is a collective that started in Japan uh, after Fukushima. Um, and basically one of the works, what they have is really the experience of this mask. And that's why I like showing it with the masks of the other two guys in the other image, um, which is kind of a parallel of the, the need for Typology, very specific typology of protection. And of course, also this resonates very strongly now with the corona. Um, and basically, what, what also the guys in Fukushima, it's almost like how don't follow the wind is also how do you not forget? How do you not forget what happened? How does the case just not become a case in the past? Like, how can you actually see the state of affairs? How can you feel it? How can you feel a closeness? How can you bridge that distance? Um, and that's basically videos that you see inside, and it's like a 3D experience of actually the sites of Fukushima. Um, down instead, you see a film by somebody called Daniel Lambo. He's actually Belgian, and um, he made a film with um, the person on his left is uh, is actually an activist on um, asbestos survivors. Um, he had, I think for family members that died working in Ethernet uh, of the same cancer. I mean, asbestos now is maybe one of the only toxic materials also that has a direct connection between a very specific typology of cancer um, and, um, and uh, sub, I mean, being subject to, it, to its fumes. And this man is actually the first one that won only a few years ago, the first case 
against uh, Ethernet, which now doesn't produce in Belgium anymore. And I mean, the, the, the effects of Ethernet and this also archival material that we had available on the show are known since the 20s. And what we found also were materials and letters written between you know, uh, executive directors at the time um, in terms of how to explain to the workers in the best possible way um, or how to not explain to the workers but by being still sort of legally um, protected, uh, what wording to use without ever using the word death um, or danger or et cetera, and instead trading it for by, by, by turning around the narrative, by talking about how the company, for example, establishes new forms of protection for its workers without even clarifying the necessity of. Anyway, he now follows, uh, the film is all about the work also of the activists that um, got in touch also with various other organizations at the moment in India because Ethernet, Ethernet transformed in, now it's called Everest, continues to produce somewhere else. Now it's, uh, I think its production is mostly like in South Africa and uh, somewhere in um, West Asia. I don't remember the exact country, but every second house um, in India was built out of asbestos in, in the last 20 years. Um, this is another, and, and you see also the, I must say the image of the boat also constantly reappears because very often this is how the toxic waste also travels. It is in boats. This was a beautiful work by um, an uh, artist, Hiranabi, um, a Pakistani artist who made a, a film on, um, maybe the second uh, biggest space in the world where basically boats go to die. And also there the question, where do things go dying <laughs> and how and what happens, what kind of economies, but also who are the workers that are taking these boats apart, which again, very often have, I have very toxic uh, because they have been transporting toxic materials for, for so, so long. And it's very interesting also here in the film, she really goes through the experience of the workers being perfectly conscious of what they're risking. And I think this is also an aspect that is very important, which is that very often there is a consciousness, but the problem is the trade. There is no other option for some. Um, and then this was kind of a closure around, you know, this is also, um, this is a tree um, <laughs> immersed in, in, in highly toxic, um, materials in, a, in, in liquids and the artist made an incredibly beautiful installation um, out of these images of death, no? So where also the borders between life and death and between good and bad are much more perilous um, than one would want to accept. Um, I think I'm being too long already if I look at the time. So I would like to ask you to play um, a film. It's just a six minutes little trailer about instead another exhibition on the same topic that we um, curated uh, maybe uh, six months later at Savvy Contemporary. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity to just hear also some of the artists speak. Um, and then I'll close and then we'll go to the Q&A. Thank you. you die for science? The reporter asked us. Science? We mixed up glue, water, and radium powder into a glowing greenish-white paint. Papua New Guinea has for a long time been dealing with the, the impacts of extractive colonialism in dealing with the impacts of colonial countries coming in and taking their natural resources, which has left people poor, but made the colonial countries rich. 
And deep seabed mining is one aspect of a long legacy of what's been happening for a long time. So this is not unfamiliar to people, this, this kind of process that this piece is about. And here at Savvy, we're showing a collaboration which we did in China in 2016. Uh, and basically, it's a, a piece of work that deals with uh, mining and processing of minerals that uh, is used to produce contemporary technologies such as cameras, laptops, uh, phones, so on and so on. And so basically uh, what we are trying to do with this piece is to expose what you could call the sort of the, the, the dark side of, of uh, the material circumstances of these technologies. So the piece is created on location on a tailing dam that is uh, a toxic uh, mineral waste deposit uh, in China. Uh, where we used uh, radioactive uh, thorium. Thorium is a byproduct of the refining of these minerals uh, to create this series of photographs that you can see in the background. And also we produced a film and this uh, video piece here. So the piece that you see in the back uh, is made out of hundreds and hundreds, around like 800 images that I found in the domestic lab of an ecotoxicologist and herbal pharmacologist called Germany Chef. When I was reinvestigating a toxic waste trade that was partially dumped two minutes away from where I grew up in Lebanon. It was sent uh, by the Italian Mafia uh, and the Lebanese forces, one of the main militias in Lebanon and currently one of the main ruling uh, political parties over there. Uh, and dumped all over, all over the country in 1988. We sat at long tables, side by side, in a big, dusty room, where we laughed and carried on until they told us to pipe down and paint. We are standing here in the piece Redistribute Toxicity that I developed together with Jonas Stuck, a researcher. He mapped the history of the toxic waste trade between East and West Germany. West Germany sending, selling its toxic waste to the east, to the dump site here. We went to this dump site, where now an enormous amount of different plants are growing. Plants that worked and cleaned the soil as a result of the toxic, toxic waste that came from the west to the, to, the, to the east. What we did there was collect seeds. The seeds from the plants, the plant workers, that cleaned this soil over decades. And we brought these back to the former West. And we're asking uh, visitors to take the seeds, to, to spread them in parks, in gardens, in forests, to return this toxic heritage, to coexist with this toxic heritage, not to outsource, but to insource it back into our daily lives. The running joke was how we glowed. The handkerchiefs we sneezed into lighting up our purses when we opened them at night. Our lips and nails painted for our boyfriends as a joke, simmering white as ash in a dark room. I brought this earth from the outer skirts of uh, Berlin, from Berlin Buch, where the former Rieselfelder um, were located. And these were places where all this canalization dark water, bad water, shit, and so on, went there. And with time by time, uh, more and more uh, industrial waste also stranded on these fields. So this earth get more and more intoxicated with heavy metals. And now I could say, OK, yeah, this is definitely toxic earth. You can find like cadmium or bly and so on in it. And um, through this steaming uh, process, um, yeah, I try to, to give the earth like a spa treatment. We heard the scientist in France, Marie Curie, could not believe the manner in which we worked and how we tasted that pretty paint a hundred times a day. Now, even our crumbling bones will glow forever in the black earth.